Hi everyone, in today's video we're going to be looking at how to calculate the free energy and then determine the temperature at which the spontaneity changes from being spontaneous to non-spontaneous. So let's see if we can just quickly sort of look back at a couple of the things that we've talked about. So we've talked about the idea that we have um, free energy, that's our energy that's available to do work, and we can find it with this equation that we talked about last time. Right? Um, and part of what we got from that second law of thermodynamics says that if the entropy of the universe increases, meaning that's greater than zero, then it means that we're going to have a spontaneous process. And by the definition that we had for what delta G was, that it was negative um, of the delta S of the universe divided by temperature, then what that means is if delta G is negative, we have a spontaneous process, and if delta G is positive, then we have a non-spontaneous process. And so again, that's stuff that we, we previously talked about, but it's really important for thinking about what we've got going on today. So first of all, let's consider the situation where we have liquid water going to solid water, right? So in this case, water freezing. There's some things that we certainly can know. If we think about the system, that is the water, well, when molecules will actually be going from a disordered state to a more ordered state. And from an entropy standpoint and a favorability standpoint, this would be something that's unfavorable, right? We know that systems prefer to be more disordered. But from a thermal standpoint, right, we're giving off energy, and we know that going to a lower energy state is a positive thing that's more favorable. And so what that means is that would be a positive. Well, if we think about the surroundings, well, we know that the delta S of the surroundings is actually going to be equal to the negative delta H of the system. So if we're giving off energy, then it turns out that the surroundings are actually absorbing that energy. And as it absorbs that energy, it's gaining disorder. And so when we're thinking about disorder overall with a system happening, in this case, we have the system itself becoming more ordered, right? Those um, water molecules are winding up in the form of ice when they form that solid. But the surroundings are actually gaining disorder, right? As that energy comes in, that creates more disorder there because that energy is being spread into the surroundings. And so in this case, we would have something that seems favorable and something that seems um, not so favorable in terms of whether or not this is likely to happen. So let's look at this specific example. Here we've got our equation showing the liquid water going to solid, and we know the delta H and the delta S for those things. And we've talked about those before, so hopefully you have a good sense of how we can figure those out. And so then we can look at our delta G of the system. Well, it's going to be that equal to the delta H of the system minus T delta S of the system. So again, everything is in terms of the system. And you might also see this written with reaction as a subscript for, for that, and that's perfectly fine too. And then we might want to answer a question such as, is this process spontaneous at 15 degrees Celsius? And in order to answer that, we actually need to know what the sign of delta G is, but it often can be useful to actually find the value. So let me have you just take a few moments, pause the video, and then answer these questions on your assignment. Once you've got that done, come back here and then we'll sort of talk through it. So hopefully you've had a chance to get your answers in there. Let's just take a few moments and sort of talk about the system. Um, so first of all, you probably know something about water freezing. You probably know that it happens at zero degrees Celsius. If we have a temperature of 15 degrees, it's not likely to happen. So hopefully when you did that calculation, you discovered that the process should be non-spontaneous. What that means is our delta G should be positive. If you ended up getting a negative delta G, now might be a good time to just stop, go back and see if you can figure out what's going on. Otherwise, we'll kind of walk through and just make sure. So thinking about this, again, we've got the delta G of the system. It's equal to the delta H of the system minus the temperature times the delta S of the system. So we put in the values we know. And again, I always strongly encourage you to write your units out here. Um, and so we should note that we've got kilojoules here for the delta H of the system. And enthalpy is almost always in kilojoules, as is usually free energy. Um, and then we also have um, over here for the delta S, we're going to be in the units of joules. So we might recognize that those things don't line up. And we also probably, hopefully, are recognizing that Celsius and Kelvin don't line up. So those two things together might be signs that, oh, crud, we need to actually do something. So let's uh, do the conversion here, and let's get into um, Kelvin first. So we can add 273 to that 15 degrees, and that'll get us in good shape there. And then, again, we can get our values here. We got minus 6.01 kilojoules. But again, here we're in joules, so we have to recognize that we have to deal with that. So let's do the conversion between joules and kilojoules. And then once we do that, we get a value of positive 0.36 kilojoules. So again, hopefully you see the process if you had something along the way, now you know uh, likely where that might have gone wrong. So we might then be wondering, well, is this process spontaneous? So again, the answer is no, because we got a positive value of delta G. Again, positive value of delta G means that our change for the universe would be negative, because again, those two things have opposite signs. But then we might think, well, well what about that opposite process? What if we had solid water going to liquid water? 
Well, when we take that equation and we would flip this around, right? We take this equation up here, we flip it into this version down here. What happens with um, delta H or delta S? Was it the sign of that? Well, hopefully you remember that, well, oh, that's gonna change the sign on those, right? So instead of being negative, we're gonna have positive values for each of these two values. Of course, if we have positive values for each of those, none of the math or anything like that would change. And so the delta G of that system would be minus 0 0.036. And so what that means is that the reverse process is actually spontaneous. And again, that's probably not too much of a surprise to you. You know, if you have ice and you set it out at 15 degrees, it would melt. Okay, so then if we go back and we think about that, so we had this uh, slide earlier, right? We had the second law of thermodynamics saying that the delta S of the universe is greater than zero, it means it's spontaneous. Well, we can actually pull in a little bit inf more information. If delta G is positive, not only is it non-spontaneous, but the reverse reaction is actually spontaneous. And so again, when we do this, we get a little bit more information out of that. And if it turns out that delta G actually equals zero, just kind of round out our opportunities, then neither the forward nor the reverse is actually spontaneous. And this is what we call a system in equilibrium. And we'll touch more on equilibrium in the future. But again, it's good to sort of sense that that's that point that we would be hitting. Now we might be really curious, well, at what temperature does this move from being spontaneous to being non-spontaneous? And so we can take that equation and we can use it in a slightly different way, right? That point where we're going from being positive delta G to being negative delta G or negative to positive, right? We have to go through the point of zero. So what we can do is we can take the delta G of the system, we can set that equal to zero. And then we put in our values. And now what we wanna do is we wanna solve for this temperature. And so again, we have to pay attention to the, some of the same things as before. So we can do a little bit of algebraic rearrangement, recognize that we've got joules and kilojoules in this particular case. And, for this example, I'm gonna convert that over into joules by having my kilojoules cancel over here. And then when I solve that, I get 272 degrees Celsius, or Kelvin, whoops. Um, of course, we probably might wanna convert that over to Celsius, and what we see is we get minus one degree Celsius, and certainly within our error, that is great, right? We know that that should happen at zero, and so getting a value of negative one, that's great. So there's a little bit more that we can do. So we've got this equation sitting up here, right? Our delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And we also have other information about how we can actually find delta H of the reaction, right? We can find that from the delta H of formations as we've talked about previously. And we can also find the delta S of the reaction based on the S of the products and the S of the reactants. Again, we see something uh, that both of these are very similar, but we could stick those things together, chink, um, put them in here. And then we see that we've got our um, delta H formation of our ice and our water, we subtract off T times the entropy of the ice and the water. And G, like enthalpy, entropy, and temperature, it's a state function. And so what that means is that its value, or the changes in it, depend simply on the states of the final and initial pieces. And so if we take this and we do a little bit of algebra, there's just a little bit more to it um, to really get there. But what we can do is we can do a little bit of rearrangement and we can find that the delta G of the reaction can actually be found as the sum of the delta G of formation of the products minus the sum of delta G of formation of reactants. Now, the reason that this is at all useful is because we can know these and we can look them up in tables. So much like we've seen with the delta H of formations, or if we look at um, entropies, we can actually have tables that have all these things. And that way we can actually create and, and calculate these things without having to do the experiment in, in lots of scenarios. So let's take this out for a spin. So here we've got a reaction. We've got hydrogen gas that's reacting with rust or iron oxide that forms iron and water. <clears throat> and the question is, is the forward reaction spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius or not? And so here we have um, some of the information about each of those different compounds. We have the entropy and the enthalpy. And so in principle, we should be able to go through and figure this out. So let me have you guys take a few moments to actually try to work through that calculation um, based on what we had in the previous slide. So you can go back and look at that if you need to. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to go through and answer those questions. So let's just see if we can uh, do a really quick version of, of running through here so you can hopefully figure out if there's any issue. So first of all, the answer should be no, it, this doesn't actually happen. That if we calculate the delta H, so we do the delta H of formation of products minus the delta H of formation of reactants, we should get a value of 98.8 kilojoules and so that should be positive. The entropy change um, is also going to be uh, positive in this particular case. And so we get 141.5. Again, this will be in joules. And so then when we put those together with this temperature, we get a value of 56.6 kilojoules. And since this is a positive value, then our, our delta G is positive, which means that it's gonna be a non-spontaneous reaction.
So now we know that this is actually a non-spontaneous re reaction. So we might be curious at what temperature does this become spontaneous? Because we know that the entropy is favorable. And so if we uh, increase the temperature, eventually that minus T delta S should get larger than whatever the delta H rate, um, component is. And that should drive the overall delta G to be negative. So we could actually be curious, when would that happen? So pause the video, try to answer that question, and then swing back. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to do that. So now let's look at this. So again, when this switches from being not spontaneous to spontaneous, that happens when delta G goes from being positive to negative, which means that we have to go through zero. And so if we set delta G equal to zero, we can actually find the temperature. And so in this case, we can do that. We set our delta G to be zero, and then we put our 98.8 kilojoules in here, minus T times, and I've already done the conversion here from joules to, uh, to kilojoules, so that's kilojoules per Kelvin. And so when we solve that, we get a value of 698 Kelvin, so about 700 degrees. So again, that's going to be something that's actually quite warm, as it turns out. Now, we can go even one step further, and we can link this back to stoichiometry and really try to understand uh, even a little bit more what's going on. So we know that um, this reaction isn't, ha isn't uh, favorable at room temperature or at uh, 25 degrees Celsius, but we know that the reverse actually would be uh, a spontaneous reaction. So spontaneous reactions can be used to do work in principle. And so we can, might be curious how much free energy is actually available to do work if we had 15.6 grams of iron reacting with water. And so we'll assume that the reaction stays at 25 degrees Celsius just to make life easier. And then remember the delta G for the forward reaction was 56.6 kilojoules. And so let's see if we, you can figure out um, how much free energy is available to do work. So at this point, you have all the information, so give that a shot, see if you can make that work out, um, and then we'll pick up with that in class.